Great. So welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a good lunch break and you enjoyed the generous um, and very good meal that the Heinrich Böll Foundation offered to us or at home. Um, yes, welcome back. Uh, maybe to, to do a little recap first, we had a very profound, brilliant introduction to the digitalization of borders and migration control by Professor Mira Georgia this morning, then a deep dive into the latest EU legislation, the EU AI Act and the Pact on Migration, with experts from civil society and a member of the European Parliament. And um, we did already discuss um, some of the continuities of colonial thinking about the, the, the um, othering that's happening in, in the current praxis and, and practice and um, legislation on migration and um, and digital rights. We talked about parallel legal systems, the normalization of exceptionalisms, but also about forging new alliances and hearing and amplifying positive visions of migration. I think um, that some of these aspects we're going to talk about again now as we elaborate further on the colonial legacies of border digitalization in our second panel. And I'm very happy to welcome um, today and online, I'll start with uh, Dr. Pin Lin Lau. She's a senior lecturer in biolaw at Brunel University in London. Her research encompasses European, international and comparative law for genome editing and the ethical legal governance of AI systems. Pin Lin published extensively on AI biases and women's health and has contributed significantly to the understanding of AI in healthcare, with her recent work focusing on the impact of AI on health outcomes of marginalized groups. And uh, in the order of the alphabet, Professor Mirka Magianu, full professor at the Department of Media Communications and Cultural Studies at Goldsmiths, University of London. Her current research focuses on the social consequences of communication technologies, infrastructures, and AI in global South contexts especially in relation to migration and humanitarian emergencies. Mirko's forthcoming book, Technocolonialism, When Technology for Good is Harmful, will shed light on how technology intended for humanitarian purposes can actually perpetuate harm. And the la last but not least, Dr. Michelle Pfeiffer, postdoctoral research associate on digital cultures at Dresden University of Technology. Their research is located at the intersections of digital media technology, migration and border studies, and also gender and sexuality studies. They explore the role of media technology in the production of legal and political knowledge on migration with a focus on post-colonial Europe. Michelle is currently working on a book manuscript titled Data on the Move, Voice, Algorithms and Asylum in Digital Borderland. That book will examine how algorithmic and media infrastructures are employed for migration control. Please help me in welcoming uh, our three experts here on our stage. Thank you. So I'm really looking forward to to now further elaborating on some of the terms that we've touched this morning. And I think one very important term that came up very early in the presentations was technocolonialism, a term that you have coined, Mirka. And um, yes, so we're just very excited to hear more about this term, where it comes from, how do you, how you, um, uh, and, and your research that, uh, that made you come up with this term. And I think we have slides for this. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> That preempts what I was going to say. Thank you so much, Monica, and thank you so much, Ines and Menja and Francesca and uh, all the other organizers. It's great to be here, and thanks to the earlier speakers. And um, I was really struck um, earlier uh, today in the previous panel when we heard how migrants um, uh, arriving uh, in Italy were forced you know, through violence to give their biometric data. And, and this kind of resonated uh, quite deeply because the book that you kindly mentioned that I'm um, uh, is coming out in a couple of months starts with a similar example. So this is uh, in the Rohingya camps in Bangladesh, where since 2017, almost a million Rohingya people live. And what um, has happened there is that they were subjected to um, uh, biometric enrollments, um, and uh, they 
express their concerns, uh, you, you know, very vocally because they were worried that data might be shared with Myanmar. They could be used for repatriation before it is safe for them to, to go to Myanmar. And of course, um, they were concerned that the digital identity system did not even mention uh, their uh, preferred name Rohingya uh, on the digital identity card, but actually called them Myanmar nationals. So they... Um, staged a number of protests, culminating into strikes um, uh, in the camps. Uh, and in response, the Bangladeshi government sent in the police, um, who beat up the protesters, and the biometric registrations continued as normal. So um, I really want to, you know, mention this example. I wasn't planning to, but what you mentioned earlier this morning um, resonated uh, so much with this, because it's, it, I think this example um, encapsulates the violence associated with some of these practices, symbolic, but actually also physical violence. So over the last 10 years, I have been studying the uses of um, digital technologies, data, and AI in response to um, uh, humanitarian emergencies in humanitarian operations, many of which involve refugees. And, and as many of you, as we've already heard this morning, we are witnessing this rapid uh, datafication and digitalization of humanitarianism. Um, the first thing that happens when a refugee comes into contact with the United Nations Agency for Refugees is to give their biometric data. Um, and biometric technologies and blockchain have a number of applications. They're not just used for uh, registration and uh, enrollment, but they're actually also used to um, uh, distribute aid. Um, and we also have um, aid distributed in cryptocurrency. Um, automated decision-making is used to decide uh, who is eligible to receive aid and who will not. Chatbots are designed to communicate with refugees, uh, even to provide psychotherapy for refugees um, uh, suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, as if people in displacement in refugee camps are post-traumatic, right? It's, this is so problematic. Um, so the list goes on and on. These um, various interventions um, are ubiquitous and they keep proliferating. So in order to make sense of these practices, I've been... Uh, developing this notion of techno-colonialism uh, over the last few years, and it's the title of my forthcoming book. Um, so it's out in a couple of months. So um, um, I've been investigating uh, this, these processes through a number of projects. I don't want to spend too much time uh, giving you details, but I've been speaking with uh, people uh, working in the humanitarian organizations, but also donors, uh, government representatives, entrepreneurs, um, representatives from digital companies, uh, policymakers, volunteers, and affected people themselves. And my argument is that um, digital innovation, data, and AI entrench power asymmetries and engender new uh, inequities between what we call the global south and the north, problematic terms, but um, I'm using them here um, uh, for lack of a better term. Um, so technocolonialism refers to the way that digital technologies, uh, data and AI um, entrench these power asymmetries, existing power asymmetries, and engender new forms of violence, structural violence, um, between um, refugees or other uh, affected communities and um, aid providers, but also, you know, relationships in the global system more, more broadly. And so technocolonialism illuminates how humanitarian bureaucracy, market forces, and governments, you know, state power, come together to uh, reinvigorate colonial relationships. So I'm not really talking about digital capitalism here only. It's not just about uh, technology companies, but it's really looking at the relationship between states, um, humanitarian bureaucracies, and market forces coming together to produce um, uh, some of these uh, forms of violence and to rework these colonial relationships. So technocolonialism recognizes that um, phenomena like displacement, migration, humanitarianism uh, are steeped in uh, colonial relations. And actually, digital technology also has its own uh, sort of coloniality. So let's look at humanitarianism, and perhaps we can um, look at the next slide, um, which 
it, you know, is deeply entangled with uh, colonial histories. It emerged um, in the colonial expansion of the 19th century. Um, and although it's often referred to as the um, expression of a natural humaneness and the imperative to reduce suffering, um, you know, ultimately the structural asymmetry between donors, humanitarian workers, and um, uh, aid recipients reproduces uh, the, the colonial um, uh, relations and the social orders which actually shaped empire, right? And the emphasis on doing good occludes some of these power relations. Um, actually, also the emphasis on emergency also occludes some of these power relations. Um, and, and it occludes the fact that um, development and humanitarianism are, are practices that ultimately benefit the North. Um, so we see this reproduction of these relationships um, of inequity between Western saviors and suffering former colonial subjects, um, which attest to the tenacity of colonialism. So technology, is also equally steeped in colonial genealogies. And science was integral to the civilizing uh, mission of colonialism, uh, a tool used to, that was used to justify colonial rule. And we know this from the work of Fanon and so many others. And, and science was used to mold colonial subjectivities. And, and, and biometrics actually have been uh, key for, for some of these practices um, and the systems of classification on which biometrics depend on, right? Um, and contemporary AI is part of these genealogies of enumeration, measurement, and classification, which were originally uh, developed by imperial powers um, to control colonial subjects. So, um, I think biometrics has come up today, but I think it is such a powerful example. Um, if we look at fingerprinting, and we can move to the next slide, um, it, you know, it was introduced by the colonial, um, if we could use, could we move to the next slide, please? Oh, thank you. So a fingerprinting was used to address fraud. So it was introduced um, by the colonial powers uh, in India by uh, the British uh, administrators. Um, and I think it's no coincidence that actually, actually um, the same suspicion animates contemporary uses of biometrics. You know, the way biometrics were introduced in, in refugee camps was to address the claim that refugees were um, um, claiming aid twice. So it was to ad address this low-level uh, fraud, right? And when you have suspicion animating a system, of course, that produces a certain, um, uh, a certain design in technology that is aimed to catch, you know, um, uh, anyone who might deviate from the role. Um, but um, I, I think the other important thing to say here is that the classifications on which biometrics are based um, uh, have these very clear colonial genealogies. They, they privilege whiteness. They privilege a white, male, able-bodied face and, and, and body. And, and I think we see that um, very much in the kind of the error margins that these technologies have, even today in their digital incarnation when measuring other bodies. Um, and all these colonial genealogies of science are most evident um, uh, or are also evident in the kind of the way re refugee camps are referred to as laboratories of experimentation. Um, these endless pilots that are taking place in refugee camps, um, uh, uh, which echo the pharmacological and medical experiments uh, of, uh, previous, uh, of the previous century. And I, that's the next slide, please. So... Um, so there is a lot of work that I draw on which looks at the tenacity of colonial legacies. I don't want to give a theoretical paper here, but I think we can see that colonialism did not end with, you know, with, with the independence of, um, uh, of, of, of uh, former uh, colonies, but continues through processes of uh, racial segregation, continues through um, um, uh, processes of extraction. Uh, it, it continues with... Um, the Eurocentric systems of knowledge production through which are imposed on, on local populations and are internalized. I mean, that's key, right? The internalization of colonialism is, is, is one of its most um, sort of pernicious uh, legacies. So we are seeing really an enduring structure of domination. And one of these um, ways in which this is um, evidenced and, and is, uh, reworks also some of the legacies is, is uh, some of these technological practices we're talking about uh, in today's uh, conference. Um, so 
I want to be clear that when I use the term colonialism, and I will end in, in, a, in a minute, I don't use it to refer to a radically new phase of colonialism. I, I do not use it as a historical prism through which to understand the present. I, I argue that colonialism is still with us. It's, it hasn't really gone away. Uh, empires collapsed, but their legacies and logics survive and permeate processes like humanitarianism and its institutions. They also permeate technology. Um, and I think that's what we've been seeing today uh, in, in our discussions. Um, and, and I also, and I feel I really need to, to say this, um, it might seem self-evident, but I don't use colonialism as a metaphor because it would be, um, it would not be appropriate, you know, it, 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 you know, given the violence associated with colonialism, to use colonialism as a metaphor is to de depoliticize the term and the phenomena that it descri describes. But I think we do need colonialism as a framework to explain why technological experiments take place in refugee camps, typically in the global south, without informed consent, because there is no consent if you're not given an alternative, right? Uh, to receive aid. So if the only if, if if biometric enrollment is a conditionality to receive aid, then there is no informed consent or meaningful consent. It becomes theater, basically, it becomes performative. Um, uh, and, and at the same time, I think what I'm trying to get to with this term is that it, this isn't just an example of neocolonialism, because technologies, the way they intersect with these bureaucratic uh, humanitarian structures um, and the way they rework um, existing uh, forms of discrimination can produce new forms of violence. And I think we need a term that can analytically unpack what is actually going on here, rather than a general term that looks at sort of, um, uh, you know, neocolonial uh, practices. So technocolonialism aims to shift the emphasis to the constitutive role of data and digital practices in entrenching inequities uh, between refugees and humanitarian agencies, but also inequities in the global context more broadly. Um, should I stop here? I mean, I can briefly sh tell you how this works, how this happens, just to give you a glimpse, or I can come back to that later. Maybe yeah, later let's yeah. do that later. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you, but that was great. Thank you. Maybe a round of applause for that. Thank you. Very, very important um, a kind of introduction to the, the term and, and how and why you use it. Um, I guess, I hope Pin is still there with us because I can't see her now. Oh. Yes, there she is. Thank you. Um, Pin, we're also very glad to have you with us today as a legal but also expert, but also um, as an intersectional feminist. I'd like to hear that perspective. I think we've touched a, a lot upon the ways the data of refugee communities is extracted and the power relations, the power hierarchies that um, play out in this, uh, in this practice. So I'd like to hear more from you about that. Okay, uh, thank you very much, first of all, for facilitating my attendance um, online and, um, and I, I'm very grateful to be here. Um, just to pick up from your question, a, lot, a large part of um, the work that I have done um, centers around the concept of intersectionality, but not just simply intersectionality, but intersectionality from um, a data feminism perspective, right? And uh, I, I see this as one of the ways in which, well, in a form of co-creation, really, uh, to, to move things forward and to sort of remove inequalities. And um, basically, the idea is, is simply co-creation, um, hinging on two specific limbs, right? The first limb being uh, intersectionality and data feminism, and the second limb being something I call the five Ps, uh, product, person, premises, practices, and processes. Now, this is not my creation. It's an adoption of regulatory processes that are from the field of healthcare and biomedicine and regulating uh, med medicinal products, essentially. But um, what, what happens is in this process of the five Ps, I think we can, there are many important takeaways to think about the co-creation process. Um, so in, in intersectionality and data feminism pr perspectives, um, insofar as the power structures are concerned, um, it's critical to, to understand, and I think we all know that oppression itself doesn't occur in a vacuum. 
and that all types of oppression, that's the view that we hold, that they are all interconnected to each other. So intersectionality means that we understand how social categorizations like race, gender, class, everything, they create overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination and disadvantage, right? And the concept of data feminism comes from scholars uh, Catherine D'Ignazio and Lauren Klein. And I, I really resonated with this uh, because it isn't simply about employing um, traditional feminist theories, but feminist theories that stem from the root of black feminism, uh, mainly the Black River Combahee, but also about the fact that this kind of uh, data feminism extends to so much more than just gender, right? And in fact, data feminism itself looks to how we can overwhelm the traditional white male techno heroes uh, models in big data, in data science and artificial intelligence. So it employs this as a lens to how we view power structures, um, especially in relation to persons who are vulnerable, key populations, women, etc., and uh, I read this really, really interesting uh, interview that Catherine D'Ignazio did um, for uh, the Nightingale Journal. And she says these things, which I'd like to just read out. She says, we should be asking questions like this. How do structural inequalities permeate data science processes? Um, think of this as uh, data science processes that are, are used in migration and border control, right? How did they infect every stage of the pipeline and what kind of questions get asked at border control for asylum seekers and uh, for refugees and things like that, right? Even right on down to the types of colors that we represent different things. Um, we have certain colors that you, you've got in your slides. I've got certain colors on my slides, but why do we use those colors? Do we even know where they come from? It comes from something deeper within, right? So this is the kind of intentionality, uh, the Ignacio says, that focuses broadly on power and, and it really permeates in, in many ways. So power differentials, not just between uh, white women and black women, academic researchers and indigenous communities, global north, global south, but they are all intersecting systems. And so um, if I may be very, very ideal, um, intersectionality and data feminism, um, I think could be one of the solutions that we can use to think about how we can, well, decrease algorithm biases, decrease the marginalization effects or consequences of artificial intelligence that are used um, in certain ways, right? Um, with, I think, the core theory of really coming down to educating data scientists, educating technical people as well, in working towards how we can attain um, ethical, equitable, equal data power. And I really don't know if that's possible. I mean, it's, it's, it's a pipe dream, right? Um, data feminism in itself has seven key principles. One, examine power. Two, challenge power. Three, elevate your emotions and embodiment. Four, rethink binaries and hierarchies. Five, embrace pluralism. Six, consider context. And seven, to make that labor visible. And I think these are some very, very powerful principles that can not only just be extended within different fields of so humanities and social sciences, but so much more within the context of border control, migration, asylum seeking, um, extending to machine learning methods in AI, for instance, designing research and uh, experiments for data whilst simultaneously working towards an intentionality of uh, improvement in this particular way. I hope that sort of answers your question, Monica. Um, yes, th thank you so much. I think also maybe Ran. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, um, I uh, laid down my microphone. Uh, thank you so much. A round of applause for this as well, please. <laughs> Um, thank you to both of you. I think this was um, this gives us two very powerful concepts: the, tech, the concept of technocolonialism and also the, the concept of, of data feminism, that uh, can help us um, deconstruct and understand what we are talking about here now. And maybe we can come back to questions of um, 
digital sovereignty and, and privacy a little later. And now I'd like to um, hear from you, Michelle. Um, Michelle uh, will be a bit of our uh, Germany expert on this panel today because uh, their research focuses on uh, also on Germany and the EU and um, on the colonial imperial legacies of um, border control in, in the EU. And if you could expand a bit on your research and share with us, that would be great. Yes, um, thank you also from my side to all the organizers um, for inviting me. It's really been really interesting conversations. Um, and um, yes, yeah, was said, I'm a media historian and anthropologist and my research looks at kind of colonial legacies and historical contingencies um, of digital migration control in Germany and in the EU. And um, I thought I would take this opportunity to talk about Germany specifically um, and kind of the different data-driven algorithmic um, technologies that are being used, um, also specifically in asylum uh, proceedings in Germany. So basically since um, 2015, which uh, was kind of the beginning of what many refer to as the a refugee crisis or has been better termed uh, the long summer of migration. What we can really see all over Europe, but also in Germany, is this kind of intensification um, of the border and asylum regime. There's kind of more restriction on, on asylum um, and uh, the borders are becoming more securitized and more violent. And the German state specifically kind of started to implement a whole range of different media technological tools in asylum determination processes. And some of them have actually been mentioned already throughout the day, um, but they include different biometric technologies um, used to verify the identity of people who are seeking asylum. Um, one of them that I want to talk about also a more a bit later is um, a voice analysis software or dialect analysis software that sort of supposedly can identify people um, on the basis of um, the, the languages they speak. There's also been this kind of large expansion of uh, migration databases and increased interoperability with policing authorities. And um, one of the things that has been mentioned also today is this practice of extracting data from people's smartphones. Um, and this is also something that is not just happening in Germany, but is sort of kind of, uh, can, we can see expanding in different countries. But basically this sort of works through a logic of um, kind of determining someone's um, identity, nationality on the basis of the data that can be found on their phone. Um, so, um, usually we talk about these things as like kind of new innovative tools, um, in Germany, they were really represented as these like very efficient, um, secure solutions to address a higher number of asylum, asylum cases and to have these more streamlined processes, um, better kind of like bureaucratic processes with less bias and so on. Like this is what we've been talking about today, right? And what I'm really looking at is how actually these technologies kind of really inform and also transform what we what we think about sort of political concepts, what we think is citizenship, what we think is belonging, what we think um, are rights, what we think it means to recognize someone, um, but also what it means to be human. Um, and I look at kind of what changes and also what stays the same when we use these digital technologies over time. Um, and there are just kind of three main points I want to make in this regard. So the first one is that really these, these tools used in Germany um, in, in this asylum regime I kind of work through this assumption that you can identify a person through their data. And this really, uh, and this was mentioned also in the previous pan panel, is a form of de dehumanization. And we can see how actually kind of the, the role that testimony plays in asylum proceedings um, is kind of shrinking because the role of the data becomes more important. And I think this kind of um, produces a lot of different kinds of um, vulnerabilities. 
So we talked about today that technologies are bad, for example. Like they don't even do what they're supposed to be doing or they fail, so they make mistakes. This can cost people their asylum status. Um, and also we see this uh, more like at the um, EU borders that the technologies that are really intended for migration deterrence, which is kind of this doctrine, you know, we've been seeing for decades that you can sort of deter migration by making it supposedly less appealing to migrate, which doesn't work and actually means that border crossing becomes more dangerous and more deadly. So more because people are um, forced to take more dangerous routes um, to cross. The second thing and sort of what I um, describe as racialized innovations, and um, Mirka has just talked about this, is really um, this kind of idea that the border is this sort of incubator that is central for technological innovation. And not just technological innovation that then is used uh, in border policing, but technological innovation that is used in all kinds of things. So you were showing us this example from the... Um, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and this is really the kind of policing or what governments often call management of migration that becomes this testing site um, that then creates new technologies but also new forms of governing migration and governing the border. And this is also possible because the migration and the border often work as an exception. And this we heard this morning from Miria, we heard in the panel before about the um, AI Act, right? Migration and border policing became the exception to the AI Act. And one of the examples that I looked at a, um, a lot in my research is the history of database surveillance um, of migrants in Germany that I think really shows this kind of um, crisis of 2015, but also where we are now, is connected to earlier productions of migration as crisis in the 1980s and the 1990s, and that they were always used to expand migration surveillance and policing. So in Germany, we have something that is called Ausländer Zentralregister. It's one of the largest databases in Germany that is stores um, personal information, but only of uh, people who migrated to Germany. Um, so I looked at kind of years, decades of files about this database, and you can basically see that it's been continuously expanded and how this expansion was always legitimated through these modes of crisis and urgency. And Mirka also just said this, right, that this kind of language of emergency can really obscure sort of like violences that are going on. So we keep on talking about emergency, urgency, crisis, and I think that we can really historicize these things because they keep on coming up. Um, and then basically my last point that I can also elaborate a bit later is what I call them, that we have this kind of coloniality of migration infrastructures. So I'm interested in kind of look, you know, where we sort of think the border is in space, but also where the border is in time. And in asylum de determination, but also in a migration databases, we can see we have this extension of the border inside the nation, right? So people uh, who go through asylum determination process in Germany, they are already physically in Germany. But this kind of like sorting between people who are constructed as deserving um, more protection um, than others, that kind of takes place inside uh, inside the kind of like geographical uh, boundaries of the border. And I also agree with what was said um, previously, you know, that this um, kind of focusing on who are the deserving refugees, the who are engineers actually kind of reproduces, you know, this kind of um, re constant reproduction of deservingness, because what about the refugees who are not engineers? Um, and then the second thing is the, what I said about where we locate the border in time. And this is kind of where we come back to the conversation we're having about the colonial underpinning, pinnings, colonial continuities um, of what we often present present or is presented to us as this like kind of new uh, new technology, but that they actually don't come out of nowhere, but they are sort of built onto tracks. And this is this word infrastructure that they are informed by these different histories of 
colonialism and racialization. Thank you. Maybe, Michelle, we can even uh, stay with you and you can uh, explain a bit more th uh, about the use of technologies like biometric language scanners in Germany. And, uh, and maybe also tell us who is using these technologies, who's developing them, who is benefiting from their use. So we Yes. Um, okay, so this is what I just mentioned that... Um, The Federal Ministry for Migration and Refugees, Bundesamt für Migration und Flüchtlinge, BAMF, um, in 2016, they started to use uh, something that they call voice biometrics, which um, I and many other people think is the wrong name for it, but that's what they call it. And basically it's um, a software that can supposedly recognize the dialect that someone is speaking. Um, they've used it for different Arabic dialects. Um, and I think now they also um, started to include, uh, I have to double check, but I think they're like kind of adding languages. Um, and basically it's sort of within, uh, within an uh, uh, asylum case, um, uh, a speech sample is taking, taken from an asylum applicant and then this is sort of used to determine the country of origin of people, um, of the person who is seeking asylum. Um, and this is not done like to, with everyone, but like people where the, um, who don't have, um, uh, identification documents, for example. So this technology has many problems. Uh, it has a very high error rate. Um, this is reported between 15 and 40 percent. Um, it is also in many ways a kind of black box, so we don't know exactly where it, how it comes to its conclusions. Um, and also it's been re reported to be used on people who don't actually speak one of the dialects it can uh, distinguish between. So uh, it's like used on people who then don't speak one of the kind of uh, main uh, five Arabic dialects it can distinguish between. So then it shouldn't even be used uh, on these people. Um, but I think sort of like more fundamentally, this is also based on a kind of false premise of using language and dialect as this indicator of someone's origin and socialization. And in my research, I interviewed a lot of uh, linguists who are working in this kind of uh, uh, field. Um, and this, basically, this is what they're saying, that it's really based on assumptions that people are only socialized in one language, for example, or that language doesn't change over time. Um, and this is kind of um, following this idea that we have something like a linguistic passport. So the language can kind of function as this form of, st um, of state identification. And I think this is also why this really became kind of attractive um, to states, a kind of attractive, attractive method of state identification. Because, you know, like, um, and this is sort of, um, I want to say a quote from, from the director of, um, she's the director of the department that is in charge of all language analysis cases in the Netherlands. Um, and she said, uh, language analysis is a form of evidence that cannot be taken away, stolen or left behind very easily as documents can. So I think this kind of really shows that, you know, the 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 uh, dialect someone speak is supposed to give us this access to their identity because it's like this innate thing that is like attached to their body so um they cannot lose it like you can lose uh, your your documents and i am really interested in how you know the voice sort of becomes this register through which the border is then articulated and policed and there are a number of ways which um, I think this kind of refers to this idea of the coloniality of uh, migration infrastructures. So the first one is that kind of basically this conception that we have a linguistic passport um, uh, that you know ties language to a place of origin um, is part of what linguists call a language ideology that maps the linguistic boundary onto a geographical boundary. So we're saying like this is identical to this, um, but it really neglects how dialects, especially in the African con con continent and in the Middle East, are really um, 
the borders that are there, they are an artifact of colonization, right? And the sort of borders that were drawn, they didn't adhere to linguistic communities. So now, basically, we are... Uh, we, we are saying, okay, the, the language is identical to the, to the uh, nation state border, but the colonial powers who made these, uh, borders, they didn't, they didn't follow which linguistic communities were there. So I think it's kind of this artifact of colonization that we are, you know, we, we can see reappearing in this technology. And can I add one more thing? Yeah. And then the, the second thing that um, I got very interested in researching this is thinking about how we can also connect this to um, a longer history of comparative linguistics um, as it was developed in, uh, in early 20th century Germany. So one of the things I did in my research is that I looked at these kind of um, colonial and racialized classifications of language and dialect, and I looked at where they actually come from. And one of the things I did was that I um, worked uh, in an archive um, that holds a lot of vo voice recordings that were uh, recorded by linguists in prisoner of war camps. Um, during the First World War and these prisoner of war camps incarcerated mostly soldiers from British and French colonies. I did this because one of the camps, um, one of the POW camps is in a place called Wünsdorf. It's south of Berlin and there is now a refugee camp. And this just happened in my research that someone told me about this kind of, um, this, this um, that there's this um, site that once was this POW camp where these linguists did all these voice recordings and it's now a refugee camp. So I got very, I got very interested in this. And um, basically the linguists at the time, they saw this camp and the prisoners as this opportunity that they could record and they collect, collect all these languages and dialects because they came from all these um, different colonies without actually having to travel to the colonies. So they, they didn't have to go to the field to do their work. They could just like um, collect the, what they called it, the voices of the world. They, collect the, they could collect them right there in the, in the imperial center. And um, there's a lot of research done on this that, you know, they really kind of, the linguists started to establish their methods of comparison. Um, they started to um, have different classifications of languages, um, different classifications of the dialects. Um, and they really use this to develop fields like phonetics, fields like musicology, but also use it for colonization projects. And this really happened sort of in the, was part of the imperial project of the German Kaiserreich. And, um, and one of the other things that I think maybe connects it more directly to this um, question of biometrics that also Mirka was talking about is that um, the other people who were like doing research in these camps were anthropologists. And what they were doing is that they were measuring people's bodies, they were measuring people's um, faces, um, their heads, and they were trying to find these kind of like, you know, elements of the body that would refer to someone's race. And this is basically a kind of prehistory of biometrics. And then the linguists were connecting this to people's voices. So this was also part of a kind of racial science that was done at the time. And I'm telling you all of this because I think that there is this kind of um, connection we can make from, you know, this sort of like rationale of language recognition that is being used now to a kind of like mode of listening to like a voices that can be objectified, that can be studied, and that we can kind of use for, for like um, a, a state that desires to locate people by means of language and dialect. And, you know, in some ways, this is kind of like not a, it's not a, a sort of um, continuous history. Uh, and there's like many things that happen in between. But I'm just kind, kind of trying to bring it as this provocation to think about, you know, the, the, the things that reappear now that are really grounded in um, these histories of racialization and race making that come from this kind of like imperial core from here. So, Thank yes. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. I think that's a very powerful example or two very powerful examples. One of like a direct history of imperialist practices of extracting data from people that couldn't 
um, couldn't uh, withhold their data. Uh, and then also this 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 idea that there is um, what you called uh, a language ideology, that there is this certain uh, dialect that is tied to uh, a certain geographical space. And I think it also ties back to what we heard in the morning, that as soon as we have like um, an AI or a system telling you that this is that and such and such dialect or such and such person, um, it becomes seemingly seemingly neutral or objective. And I think this is uh, one of the very important um, things that we have to keep in mind when we think about um, AI because it makes um, subjective knowledge look objective or neutral. And um, this brings us back to you, Pin, because I think um, you already explained um, about data feminism, but I think maybe we can take a step back first and, and, and talk about data and why data is so important for AI. I don't think everybody in the room knows exactly how data, how AI works and, and, and how kind of bias creeps into, into, um, into AI through the data sets that are used. But I think you can explain that to us very well. Thank you very much. And uh, can you see the slide that I've put up here? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. So this is just the backdrop of um, what I'm going to be sort of um, explaining in terms of data and all that. So um, very, very simply put, artificial intelligence systems, uh, I'm not a, an engineer, but uh, this, I tried to do the best that I can. Uh, they're in essence basically trained um, by methods of machine learning And then they use algorithms to train the systems so that certain tasks <clears throat> or functions can be performed independently and in an automated way. Um, also keep in mind automation because that's something I'm going to come back to later, right? However, the question, the, the problem is that it is almost impossible, I think, to generate outcomes that are pure and completely fair because Value systems of human persons are activated when you when we ourselves program the systems, right? And the notion of fairness is also arbitrary and may differ from one perspective to another, depending on the contextual framework. So when AI systems are taught through algorithms, not only is it vital that the relevant machine learning method that is used is appropriate, It's also crucial that the data sets, the training data that's being used um, that would allow the system to learn and to diffuse patterns and to make connections are also of good quality, that they're also representative and that they're also inclusive. And this really comes back to uh, the point Michelle was making earlier about the imperialism, the colonial, colonialization elements. And a lot, there's a lot of historical bias in data sets that are being used. But before I come to algorithms and biases, I, I want to talk a little bit about data and specifically almost an unheard process within the AI factory is a process called annotation. Now, a lot of um, a, a lot of people talk about, oh, this data set is not good or there's algorithm bias, but they don't see first what happens to the raw data. Where does the raw data come from? And this is where... Um, annotation comes in. And this is a very tedious piece of work that involves processing raw information, which is then used to train the AI. So before the AI systems learn something, the data has to be sorted and tagged by human beings, right? And there is a vast network of a workforce that is hidden behind the machines. Like think about self-driving cars, How does a Tesla identify a vehicle, a pedestrian, a cyclist, etc.? They do so because the footage or the information or the data is already labeled beforehand, right? It identifies all these possible stakeholders. Um, it identifies frame by frame from every possible camera, ang uh, camera angle. And this is extremely difficult and repetitive work. And think about it, right? A several second uh, footage few seconds can actually take eight hours to annotate that particular data. And so some in, I, I, as, as I went digging down into this rabbit hole, 
Um, I actually found out that Amazon actually has a crowdsourcing platform called Mechanical Turk. And what it does is people from all around the world compete uh, in this crowdsourcing platform to perform small tasks for very, very cheap. And what they do is to annotate data sets, right? And this annotated data set, um, a, a popular one is called ImageNet, for instance. It really enabled breakthroughs in machine learning that has brought AI into what we know today. So whilst annotation remains a foundational part of making AI, <laughs> there is often a sense among engineers, please don't kill me, any engineers out there, that it's actually a passing and inconvenient unglamorous prerequisite um, to the more glamorous work of building systems, building models, right? So what happens in annotation is you collect as much labeled data as you can, as cheaply as possible to train your model. And therefore, if it works, at least in theory, you no longer need the annotators, right? But the process of annotation really never finishes because systems are continually um, evolving, right? And machine learning systems is no exception. They are prone to failure when they encounter something that isn't well represented in their training data, right? And it can have very serious consequences. And one of these happened in 2018 where there was an Uber self-driving test car. It killed a woman because even though it was programmed to avoid cyclists and pedestrians, it didn't know how to interpret this woman who was walking her bicycle across the street. Right. So the more AI systems are put out into the world to dispense, you know, advice, medical help, uh, profiling, the more these types of cases might be encountered and the more humans are needed to sort them. So if we think about it, there is a hugely human element to the machines behind artificial intelligence. Right. And uh, an interesting fact uh, also about power structures, for instance, another company known as Remote Tasks, it also uh, uh, offers remote work to anyone fluent in English for annotation. It is actually the worker-facing subsidiary of a company called Scale AI that is a multi-billion dollar Silicon Valley data vendor. And this data vendor has the US military, open AI, and, you know, um, and many other billion-dollar companies amongst its customers. So I think go figure over there, right? Um, so that's that's the annotation process. And we come then to the data sets. So any machine or any algorithm that is trained with human-generated data will only be as effective and fair as the data it has been trained with. So it's important, and this is what we try to consistently um, remind people, that all stakeholders in the life cycle of an AI system is aware of potential biases that they may face at each particular stages, right? Um, so things like um, quality, diversity of data, because data can be tainted with bias. It can be built in with historical prejudice that translate into inequalities into society. It can be unrepresentative. Um, in, in, in my research um, in AI used in health, uh, women have been deliberately excluded from medical or clinical trials for a very, very long time. And this results in a gender gap in medical data. And this is because of the historical notion that men's bodies were the standard for any form of medical testing, right? So the, the very common phrase that we hear is rubbish in, rubbish out um, to describe this type of particular phenomenon. And if I have time, I'm just going to go a little bit into algorithm bias and why it matters. Um, so we see already the processes from annotation to the machine learning itself and now how the biases get reproduced, right? And this refers to systematic errors or inaccuracies in decision-making processes of the AI technologies, right? And these biases come true. It's literally a cycle, right? It gets introduced through the bias data sets. It gets introduced through a lack of diversity in the training data of flawed algorithms, right? And, um, a really great example of, of how this has occurred. Unfortunately, it's unfortunate, but it's been revealed. For instance, um, there was a MIT um, <clears throat> researcher, scientist, computer scientist, who made the discovery that some algorithms actually cannot detect dark skin faces 
or couldn't even detect women with accuracy. And then you realize that the very machine learning algorithms that we intend, that are intended to avoid prejudice, be, are only really as unbiased as the humans and the historical data programming them. And if you're interested, there's a documentary about this called Coded Bias on Netflix, right? Um, Thank from you. From the legal... Yep. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I can go into something else later. We can discuss it later. Thanks, Micah. Thank you. I think that... Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Just clapping in the room. Thank you. I think that was a very good uh, good introduction for, for us to, to understand where bias in data sets comes from. Um, I, I kind of uh, didn't want to cut you off here, but I really want to um, touch um, uh, one upon one subject that we that we talked about a lot in the morning, and I think it's very important if you talk about colonial legacies and um, border digitalization, and that is the the framing of um, migration as a security concern. Um, I think it was very interesting to hear that it's a recent development, um, but I think it's the most powerful narrative that we have in migration control at the moment. And I, I would like to hear from you, Michelle, I think you, you are also studying the so-called smart borders. Um, and, um, and here I think it's important for us to understand who, how are they smart and for whom are they smart and, um, And how does this feed into this whole notion of securitization? Um, yes, so, um, yeah, I think we've talked about this throughout the day, but um, maybe, I mean, okay, so in general, we have all these um, smart border projects that were mentioned today that kind of part of this militarization and securitization of borders. Um, And, um, you know, a large number of the, these projects are funded through EU funding schemes like Horizon 2020. Um, and different technologies were used, uh, were mentioned today, uh, pre trying to predict border crossings, um, using different kinds of surveillance, spatial surveillance of border zones, different decision making systems, um, also everyday surveillance of non citizens. So all of these are kind of lumped, often lumped under this buzzword, smart borders. Um, and I think it kind of articulates a very uh, particular future and present of, a, of the bordered state that then kind of invokes these promises of, again, efficiency, optimization, neutrality, seamlessness um, that we tie to data fight technologies. And the European Commission, they um, passed a smart borders package in um, 2013 um, and they were also talking about this kind of seamlessness. So this smart border package was kind of to provide a more streamlined travel to the EU without interruption. So literally without seams. Now I don't remember who, but someone today talked about this kind of, for some people, the border becomes like invisible. Uh, whereas like for others, um, was Miriam was like for others, it becomes like more present, more violent. Um, and I think it's the same with the smart borders package because then it also included um, this kind of uh, widespread collection of personal data uh, for the fight against what the commission calls irregular migration that then again reinforces these violent and racialized um, discriminations of borders. Um, so yeah, we learned this today, right? They are supposed to be less invasive, less violent, reduce crimina discrimination and bias, be more efficient. And then actually what happens is there are these um, invasions of uh, rights to privacy, reinforcement of discrimination and bias. Um, and then we often have these like very kind of black box decisions and predictions that are being made. And um, the point that I want to maybe add to this is that You know, it, I think this is kind of part of this larger, um, again, um, ideology that is behind this idea of smart borders is that they proclaim this techno solutionism um, and by our governments and then by the companies that are selling these technologies. Um, and this really recasts, I think, what are political issues. And I think Miria also said that this morning um, about mobility injustice, about global displacement that is happening due to warfare, genocide, climate catastrophe. Um, this is being 
being kind of uh, these pr problems um, are supposed to be solved by these calculations that are made by smart borders. And then again, this I think sort of um, deflects or makes makes us ignore that there are sort of these inherent injustices of borders. And, um, and that's why I think we kind of have to also go beyond, um, and I've been doing this today too, beyond kind of asking, you know, if the borders are actually smart, um, if, you know, a particular AI is actually as intelligent as it kind of promises to be. Um, um, also going beyond, you know, kind of thinking about this sort of technical malfunction, malfunctionalities, because I think there's sort of this risk by also focusing on the kind of these technological gadgets that are being sold to us, um, that there's also this kind of idea that maybe there is an eventual technological solution where borders can be fixed, right? And that we actually, by doing this, we depoliticize how technologies are complicit within wider border regimes, whether they're smart or they're not smart, right? Like whether we ha they're, they're enforced by technology or by humans. Um, so I think I am... By saying this, I, I want to kind of like want us to pay attention that by only focusing focusing on these kind of new technological gadgets that we kind of obscure what is the underlying function of the border that was also there before we had these technological gadgets. And I think this is why we're having this panel basically, right? This is why we're kind of having this, trying to have this um, historicizing uh, or contextualizing move um, um, that we're attempting to do by placing these technologies, te technologies within histories um, to really think about what, uh, what are the underlying operations these technologies are supposed to serve and how they then also go, go back, for example, to um, um, uh, histories of colonization. So maybe I just stop yep. there. But yeah, I mean, this is also, okay, just to add one more thing that um, I think this is also um, a suggestion to to realize that this is also only one possible like present and future of how borders are supposed to, um, uh, of how borders look like, right? So now we're in this kind of state and um, my boss, um, who's a historian of science, Reid Halpern, she and her colleague Robert Mitchell, they described this as the smartness mandate. So, you know, our homes, um, our cities, our borders, they all kind of follow this logics of artificial intelligence and machine learning that then kind of re reduce complex lives into these kind of forms of optimization. Um, but this is only kind of like one version of the world that we have to live in and that there could also be kind of ways to articulate other futures where maybe we don't have borders and we think about justice in like, you know, in we think about a just world as a world that doesn't have borders. And this is sort of what I think the historical, um, this historical move and this kind of paying attention to continuities can allow us to do. So we get away from always talking about this sort of newness um, and techno solutionism that is sort of like being sold to us um, um, with these smart smart border projects. Thank you. I think this um, is uh, very very important to us to understand that really the notions that we have about policing borders about borders themselves, about where borders are happening and who is allowed to cross them or not comes from a colonial thinking. And as as you put it, Pin, very um, directly, it's rubbish in, rubbish out. So there's not going to be a, a, a solution that that uh, goes beyond or is, is uh, more visionary than than what what we have at the moment at the moment. I think um, one example of how data and and how data is extracted in a in a very violent way and then also used in a in a coercive way um, um, that that fits well with Pin's explanation of um, how data is often often being um, extracted and and data sets are built in an in an unfair way is also what you're researching, um, Mirka, in the refugee camps. So you already talked about the the biometrics. Maybe you can talk 
uh, tell us a little bit more about how biometrics are used in refugee camps um, as a means of control rather than a means of support for refugee communities or as a means of enabling them to to um, access their rights or make use of their rights? Yeah, no, I, thank you. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, biometrics are sort of the, one of the most sort of ubiquitous um, uh, technologies used in uh, the response to um, uh, refugee uh, flows uh, by humanitarian organizations. It's the first thing that happens when refugees come into contact with uh, the UN. Uh, and there are many different uses of biometrics, sort of very ordinary uses of biometrics. So I'll, I'll speak about one, which is perhaps the most common, uh, and that is the the way biometric technologies underpin cash distributions. Now, you probably know that um, increasingly there is a, a move to um, uh, give uh, people in need uh, aid, uh, to give people cash rather than aid in kind. Aid in kind has been criticized for being paternalistic, for assuming what refugees need. Um, so the most recent iteration is that this aid is distributed uh, virtually and it is, um, I'll tell you how it works in, in several camps um, in the Middle East, but actually also in Ukraine, which is that you would um, go to a designated grocery store and um, uh, shop uh, when you know that your um, allowance has been received in the system. And then at the uh, counter, uh, as you, uh, you know, instead of paying by cash, you scan your iris, which authenticates your uh, credentials against the UNHCR database. Um, and then through blockchain technology, uh, your um, uh, the sum is then released to the merchant. Uh, so it's a cashless transaction uh, uh, enabled through biometric authentication. And, and this is promoted as a way of kind of providing refugees with digital wallets, it's kind of framed very much in this idea of sort of empowerment and, 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 and making refugees very uh, empowered. Now, um, there are a number of issues here, of course. Um, you know, one of the issues is that um, there are errors in the system, as Michelle has mentioned already, and, uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's mentioned it also earlier this morning. So, rather than being the perfect identification technologies, these you know, uh, biometrics, um, you know, reproduce you know re discrimination. They they privilege whiteness. They privilege able able bodies, and and and, uh, and and so there is a higher margin of error, of course. And of course, we know that if there is an error when you're in in extreme precarity, you can, um, you know, the consequences can be devastating. There is also, apart from the practical issue of not receiving your aid, there is the violence of not being defined as, or, or rather, the the violence of being defined as someone who is not you. You know, to quote. Um, Glissant, you know, it is. It is. Uh, there is that violence. Uh, this more symbolic violence as well, and and of course there is the production of race uh, by you know through these errors, through the fact that it is white bodies measuring um, racialized bodies. That's another way through. Uh, you know, uh, the white gaze produces um, race to use uh, again Fanon's framework, but there is another really um, uh, you know. Uh, important uh, element of control here, which is, as I said in the beginning, these systems have been introduced to uh, move away from the more paternalistic system, which is essentially telling refugees what they need. But actually, we're moving back to this system because with these grocery stores, which may, you know, they're not necessarily fully-fledged supermarkets, so they might you might go in and you might find rice, you know, bread, some goods you are again being controlled in terms of shopping those goods. You don't get your allowance, which you can then go and spend in the market where there is actually competition and you can get whatever you want and spend it in whichever way you want. You can buy secondhand things, you know. You have to spend it in those designated places. So, and you can only spend it within a particular geographical location. So it is a way of controlling movements. You know, you're, you're being, again, in inevitably controlled. So there is that other dimension. And of course, there is a coloniality in the sense that there is a particular framework around money, around transaction that is imposed in cultures which may have very different understandings about, you know, 
uh, the symbolic value of money. Um, uh, and, and that is another dimension as well. There are reports also coming, for example, from Zatari Camp, which uh, suggest that refugees feel a, a bodily invasion, which again, again, to look at the colonial genealogies, if you look at the, the way um, uh, uh, indentured laborers in the Transvaal in South Africa were talking about biometric technologies at the turn of the 20th century, they were saying that they felt that they had been, um, that, that they were being uh, shackled through uh, fingerprinting, you know, so they were using those kinds of terms. And in interviews with refugees in Zatari, it transpires again, Margie Cheeseman has done great work on this, is that trans transpires that again, refugees feel this kind of sort of invasion, uh, bodily invasion. So that is another way through which this technology becomes invasive, let alone the discriminatory issues that we discussed earlier. One thing to say to link to the securitization debate, which I think is also important, is that some of the companies that provide these systems, the systems that do the biometric authentication, are the exact same systems that provide airport security. So it's the same companies using the same systems, which can be interoperable. So you have this infrastructuring going on whereby these systems um, Potentially, because again, the opacity does not always allow us to know who is speaking to, you know, which system is speaking to which system, but potentially systems that are speaking to each other and creating further vulnerabilities because, um, you know, we're talking about very sensitive foundational data that if they are shared, they can cause huge uh, harms, uh, you know, uh, to, to very vulnerable uh, groups. So, yeah. Thank you, Mikra. Thank you also for mentioning like who is, who, where, who are the, what are the companies behind that? And then we have, we've heard that the EU is investing a lot of money, billions of yeah. money, uh, billions of euros into, into research on that. And Pin, you mentioned that some of the big companies selling data sets are selling it to the military alike, um, other, any other, um, companies, um, um, developing tools. At this point, I would like to try to, to look at one, um, a, a first, um, maybe more positive framework, um, uh, or, or we'll, we'll see. And I'm excited to hear, uh, from Lynn about that because there is this morning, we talked about two legal frameworks, um, at the EU level. But there's also a European Framework Convention on Human Rights and AI that we haven't talked about at all. Um, today, um, it is a framework convention by the Council of Europe. And for those of you who, who haven't studied uh, political science in European studies, um, maybe you won't, you wouldn't know, but there's a, the Council of Europe is a totally different um, uh, institution from from the European Union um, and has member states that um, uh, Turkey, for example, is a member state. Russia used to be a, a member of the Council of Europe. Um, it's, it really is a body for human rights and it has been working on a framework convention on human rights and AI um, over the last years. Uh, they finalized the treaty this March and it will be opened for signatures to Europe and um, to some other like so-called like-minded countries that developed this framework together. It was, I think, the US and Argentina and some other countries and, and actually the world. If some of you have heard about the Istanbul Convention, that is also a, a convention um, or, the, or the European Human Rights uh, Convention, actually. These are um, conventions of the, the Council of Europe, so it is a very important institution. Um, and they also, so they also developed this, um, this framework. And um, I would, I know that PIN has studied this framework a little bit, and I would be so Excited to hear, maybe Pin, you can give us some hope that this is a, a more progressive framework. Um, I know or read that they, it also grants exceptions when it comes to national security. But um, yeah, let's let's hear from you what it says about migration and on our topic. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I want to say that I have good news for you, <laughs> but um, I'm critical of 
some of the things, but let's just sort of talk about it. As, as you all heard already this morning on the EU AI Act, um, that is very much focused on risk, right? As the main object and justification. And it's, you know, by the European Union. And so I'm actually personally a bit critical of the claim commitment of the AI Act itself to be able to protect fundamental rights, because I think it leaves the fundamental rights risk unmeasurable. So for me, the problem is not a fundamental rights hiatus in the AI Act, but that it's really not sufficiently transparent and precise about what it will achieve. Um, and also, actually, I think it corresponds with the decades-old criticism of the EU's human rights performance that the genuine comprehensive negotiations for human rights would actually take place under the Council Europe and not under the EU framework itself, right? And so when, you know, there is optimism, obviously, in the new convention from the Council of Europe, especially when we know the track record of the Council of Europe and the level of fundamental rights protections that it tries to, to, to cover very much more significantly, of course, uh, than the EU. But the EU is about the market, right? It's about unifying market standards. So there's that difference over there, right? Now, um, it's important to note that whilst the convention is an international treaty, it doesn't actually impose immediate compliance requirements. So it's absolutely not like the EU AI Act at all. Right. It focuses on protection of universal human rights affected by AI systems. But what it does is to serve as a policy framework that signals the direction of future regulations and aims to sort of align um, procedures at an international level. Right. So when we think of it this way, yeah, it looks like it it will actually enhance the protection of fundamental rights in complementarity with the EU AI Act, right? And if we look at the contents of the um, AI convention here, it encompasses all the key fundamental principles, things like equality, non-discrimination, privacy, personal data protection, accountability, responsibility, legal liability, transparency, oversight, safe innovation, public consultation, and additional measures, right? So when it first came out, particularly when the zero draft version first came out many months ago before the, 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 the final version this year, I think a lot of us were very excited because um, especially those who were very much more concerned about the human rights implications of AI. And so it's possible to actually interpret that because the main um, factor about the convention is to protect human rights, then it gives us a little bit more comfort when we think about the use of AI and the protective human rights mechanisms that are available to individuals, right? So coming back to the convention, um, there is obviously that scope, unfortunately, where it excludes certain things from the application, right? So like the EU AI Act, it has certain exceptions, which includes one, uh, protection of national security, and two has to do with research and development, never mind, not here, and three is national defense. So two big exceptions here, national security, national defense. And I think these exceptions are quite broad, right? And it doesn't really explain how we can work with this. And th the criticism is that these particular loopholes can actually undermine essential safeguards. It can still lead to unchecked AI experimentation. It can lead to use for border control, for migration, for policing, for surveillance without oversight. And this similar criticism was leveled against the EU AI Act as well, right? The other um, sort of issue is also that the convention, it mandates compliance reporting, but it doesn't actually have a robust enforcement mechanism. And so when we think about the fact that if you don't have stringent enforcement and accountability, then the impact of the convention itself will be limited, right? And there are also concerns about what kind of remedies for human rights violation will be available if there is a human rights violation by AI systems, right? And because of the implementation guidelines, which, which, are, which are quite beautiful, but worded rather broadly, there is a lack of clarity over here, right? Um, having said that, having said that, um, I don't know if you'd like to hear this, but one of the other things about um, 
the criticism of this convention was that it was actually drafted behind closed doors, right? Since civil society organizations were initially excluded, despite the fact that guidelines for open civil participation for political uh, decision making was actually there. And also, uh, the other criticism is that it actually does not cover private actors, uh, to uh, private actors. Yeah, that's right. So it is actually. Um, for the um, the parties to determine how to address the implications that arise from the use of AI when it is done by private actors. So question mark over there, it doesn't tell us how. However, a little measure of hope, hopefully, because I think this convention will form the bedrock of AI regulation, not only in the Council of Europe, but together in the EU or so, it is expected that the European Court of Human Rights in the future will actually draw conven- uh, inspiration from this convention when also interpreting the European Convention of Human Rights. So I think there is um, some significant cross-fertilization effects for EU fundamental rights law, um, which includes the implementation of the EU AI Act, because I think the European Convention on Human Rights actually forms the minimum standard of human rights protections under Article 52 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union anyway. So I think states, even private companies, will therefore have to be cognizant of the potential overlapping effects of the European Convention, the EU AI Act, as well as this particular convention on AI and human rights. And I hope um, that leaves us with a little bit of positivity for the future. Thank you so much. Um, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. But I do hear a caveat about the the um, the loopholes of, of secure, sec- national security and defense again. So this brings us back to um, the fact that we do need to shift the discourse. We need alternative narratives um, about migration um, and we need them now in a way Michel um, you're also thinking about alternative uh, narratives of mobility and belonging maybe you can give us some some ideas of um, where we can go with that or uh, inspire us a little bit um, before we leave this panel and this this conference with your ideas um yes i mean i guess in the sense this is what i i already gave it away you already got all of my <laughs> positive uh, things um in what i said about the kind of what i think this conversation about the um, historical uh, colonial histories and continuities is doing is that i think it can actually also provide us with with a way to think about a different present and a different future and that you know there's like a lot of reasons why we got to where we are now but these are you know also contingent so they could also be different so the future could also be different basically this is what I was trying to say in my kind of critique of the critique of smart borders that we were practicing today um And then just briefly, I think the other thing is also just to um, think about how I think all of or like many of the media technologies that we were talking about today uh, in themselves mediate the struggles over mobility and movement. So I think, for example, the smartphone is a very crucial example for that, right? It's like a very ambivalent technology. And Miria was talking about it this morning. Um And there's also a, a resource um, from um, Brot für die Welt. They made this um, uh, online dossier, dossier about um, uh, use of smartphones by people on the move. It's called A Blessing and a Curse. And I think that all, it also shows very well this ambivalent place of the smartphone. So that, you know, on the one hand, it's this kind of like, Uh, infrastructural necessity for possibilities of flight and it's also this kind of like very mundane tool that uh, all of us engage with um, and is an important means of communication um, but that it's also become this kind of um, target um, this liability as Miria was also talking about in this target of state surveillance um, um, of migration and flight and you know we've mentioned that there's this practice of analyzing um, smartphone data um, also in, in asylum cases. Um, 
But I think it's kind of, if we sort of thinking about this sort of perspective that the struggle is taking place over, over this technology, I think can also sort of point us to, you know, if you want to call it like fugitive or um, forms of resistance or forms of reclamation that we are all using these technologies um, all the time as well. And I was thinking about um, what... Um, Uh, Katarina said in in the previous panel um, about kind of the the sort of ways in which we will all become affected by the things that we we made we were part of making possible um, and uh, M. S. Cesaire, who's a Martinican writer, um, he described this sort of um, many decades ago uh, in the 1950s as the boomerang boomerang effect. And to kind of show that, you know, the tactics of domination uh, used by European powers in, in the colonies um, sort of will be turned against the c civil societies also um, in, in the imperial metropole. So maybe one of the narratives to say is also to kind of recognize the, um, the shared implications, uh, responsibilities, but also um, um, the, the sort of shared ways in which we are affected by um, surveillance technologies um, is maybe one way also to think about a different, a different narrative. Thank you. Mirka, maybe you can also um, add to that and tell us a little bit about the, the way in which refugee communities that you have worked with or um, have done interviews with are resisting to the kind of control mechanisms and intrusive uh, use of technologies that you've described to us earlier so that we can also understand that this is not only something imposed on people but something that they resist against. Yeah. No, techno-colonialism is inherently um, contested, you know, and um, structures of power re engender resistance. I mean, we know this uh, very well. Um, but I think in highly asymmetrical settings, like the ones um, we're talking about here, um, resistance is not always um, overt. And, and I think that's part of the difficulty sometimes that, you know, there is resistance, but it's not necessarily recognized as such um, uh, because it takes place below the radar. You know, it takes place in small acts. And we often associate uh, resistance, you know, if, we, if we're writing about resistance or activism, you know, we have this imaginary of revolution. We privilege this idea of overt resistance, sort of outright defiance. But it's not actually an option for people in authoritarian regimes. Of course, there could be overt resistance resistance in authoritarian regimes, but often the cost is too high. And, and in refugee camps as well, you know, when there is the conditionality, you know, you need to receive aid, you know, that constrains you uh, significantly. But um, what I want to say here is that we need to really abandon perhaps this kind of more Western understanding of resistance and make a uh, sense of um, the different small acts of resistance from the point of view of refugees themselves. Um, and one point I want to make here uh, in this kind of understanding of the small acts of resistance is refusal. Um, because one thing that is really striking is that a lot of these um, innovations, especially apps for refugees or the, the, the chatbots I mentioned earlier that are bespoke chatbots designed to communicate with refugees or provide mental health support for refugees and so on, are actually not really used. Um, there are thousands and thousands of sort of digital relics of these different um, apps. And I think that speaks volumes. There are people are essentially voting with their feet, they're, they're abandoning these apps. And I think that is, 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 is quite a powerful example. It's not a very visible example because it doesn't involve, you know, marching in streets or rallies, but actually it's a visible, um, uh, it, it's a very telling uh, uh, way of, of say, saying this, this is not something we, we care about. It's not, it's not really for us. Um, we also see examples of technology being appropriated in, in unexpected ways. And of course, this was mentioned uh, earlier today uh, as well, of technology being used to document human rights abuses. And that actually interestingly happens very often with co in collaboration with activist groups or civil society. Just to give you an example, um, Forensic Architecture, which is an agency based at my university at Goldsmiths, University of London, are doing great work documenting human rights abuses, working with refugees and, uh, and others, and, and, and bringing you know, uh, those um, 
perpetrating violent acts to account. Um, so we're seeing this kind of digital witnessing and storytelling um, uh, use of technology, which I think can be uh, encouraging. One of my ex-PhD students, uh, she's now um, uh, a lecturer at the University of Chiang Mai, worked with refugees uh, at the border between Thailand and Myanmar, and she was working with refugees using rap and uploading you know, rap onto YouTube as a way of telling what is actually happening in their camps, you know, as a way of documenting uh, their stories. And these were stories of hope as well. So yeah, there is hope. Um, uh, but I want to also say that while it's possible to refuse um, a psychotherapy app that's being presented to you, or you can refuse an app uh, that is useless. It's not possible to refuse biometric enrollments when aid is conditional on those. And I think that's why I think biometrics is such a sort of point that we return to time and again, because it is, um, you know, it becomes sort of conditional, uh, you know, in terms of determining entry, determining asylum, determining basic human rights uh, and, 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 and protection. And, and I think we need to recognize those, those limitations as well. Thank you. And I think also very important to remember, or to remind us that um, this is a, a technology that can very easily be used for uh, ourselves as well. Um, yes, but uh, we'll have, um, before we have, I, I want to ask the last question to Pin. I would also like to invite you to think about questions that you want to ask. We um, started 10 minutes late, so we'll have another 15 minutes from from now and I'd like to yes invite you again to to also speak up let us know what you think or ask questions to our panelists and experts and now please pin you um so beautifully started to to describe data feminism um in the beginning I'd like to hear more from you about that and, and more about people-centered AI and and future uses of of AI in a, in a more visionary way. Uh, thank you so much. So yeah, I've already talked about how I think co-creation is one of the important ways of moving forward. And obviously uh, I, I talked about the first limb being intersectionality and data feminism. And the second limb um, is about stewardship essentially, right? And um, whilst we have a regulatory framework under the EU AI Act and now the Convention for AI, right? Um, I think we need to think about possibilities of whether eff efficient stewardship can be sort of trickled down from the regulatory framework into the more practical sort of dimension, right? Um, what I wanted to talk a, bit, a little bit about, which I missed <laughs> earlier, was the, the notion of digital sovereignty as well, which is, uh, you know, the control of data, software, standards and protocols, processes. And, um, of course, um, I think Michelle mentioned it earlier already, the EU borders themselves has become digitalized, right? And the EU itself serves as a, a key site for the politics of digital sovereignty, of controlling digital data, software, and infrastructures in terms of refugees and migrants. So I want to, to think about how we can then take this digital sovereignty and apply that at the individual level for migrants, for refugees. We know they face unique challenges, displacement, they rely on external agencies for digital services. This impacts their sovereignty, right? Their privacy is impacted as well because aid organizations collect all their data for assistance and the misuse can harm their privacy. Biometrics data, uh, surveillance itself, right? So how do we then return these digital sovereignty back to them? And uh, a radical uh, sort of idea that I had, which I know is not always... Uh, practical is about what we call SSIs, right? Self-sovereign identity, which is actually something that is already being used in virtual worlds right now. So uh, part of my research, uh, just an aside, is on Web 3.0, the metaverse, blockchain technologies, and virtual reality. And SSIs is user-controlled decentralized digital identification. And advocates for SSIs believe that it empowers marginalized groups, including refugees and migrants, right? Because then what happens is the control, they have control over the data, 
over their own information and over the mechanisms of sharing so that it doesn't get misused, right? Now, of course, it's not fail-proof, right? And there's question about neutrality. There's question also about refugee capacities. But then, you know, I think this is also a very colonial way of thinking by saying refugees don't understand how to use, uh, how to manage their own data. I mean, yes, that may be true for many of us right now as well, right? And so yes. it comes down to empowering about self-sovereignty of, of that data. And self-sovereignty in itself, by empowering, then creates the co-creation process, right? It um, contributes to that co-creative process. It contributes to the stewardship process, right? And um, moving forward, besides the regulatory framework, I think it's important for us to reflect on um, mindful monitoring, right? Um, and in relation to data, for instance, I think we uh, some there were some suggestions, and I think they're fantastic, is to identify types of data sets. One, trusted data. So you know, yeah, I can use this. Two, you might have like a cute data pool of potentially worthwhile data. And three, problematic or unreliable data. And, you know, I regularly assess this, right? To see how reliable it might be, if it's still relevant, or maybe if you have something that's parked away for now, does it have a new role to improve your existing pool of trusted data for specific actions, right? And of course, continuing with guiding principles like transparency, explainability, reversibility, and beyond the data protection authorities that are established under the EU AI Act, under the GDPR, I think it's also important for organizations to think about establishing data of advocates within these organizations to oversee uh, data practices and to also include stakeholders. I like to call this the digital ecosystem and the stakeholders themselves become responsible for ensuring um, that data sets are appropriate and to see if there are any flaws or errors in AI outputs that are very early on. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Any questions here in in the room? Anybody? I know it was a, a long a long day. Maybe I've asked all the questions that you already had that you had in your mind. Any comments in the room? Unfortunately, uh, we can't he have any comments from our online viewers. I think there were there were 150 people uh, watching us online in the morning. Unfortunately, they also cannot have coffee and, and cookies with us in a few minutes or now, if none of you is wanting to, to ask a question. No? Yeah, there's one. Thank you. Good. We need the icebreaker question. I'm sure there will be more questions. Thank you. It's not really a question, actually. I just wanted to note something. First of all, thank you for all your contributions. It was super interesting. And thank you especially to Pin, who also pointed out this labor, the human labor that is actually behind AI, um, because I think we also do have cases of externalization of this labor where these companies um, externalize these really hard tasks of scraping and scanning. Um, the content for, for example, child pornography or other violence, which is leaving basically these people totally traumatized without any regard for their physical or mental yes. health, which we have had in Kenya from partner firms uh, of OpenAI. And yeah, I just wanted to add that um, because it's another, I think it's another example of this coloniality that we still have continuously and they're framing them, themselves as ethical AI for basically getting people out of poverty, paying them two years an hour. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to, to add this. Thank you. Thank you. Very important comment. There's a comment by Menja, but you maybe want to answer first? before. Oh, no. until just, just to say that uh, I completely agree with you on that. And in fact, uh, uh, tomorrow I'm actually presenting at another con uh, another conference and it is precisely this issue that I talked about because this con this other conference is actually about content moderation and about content policing in virtual reality and one of the things that uh, that I raised in that regard is the health safety 
and regard for human moderators, right, um, in virtual reality, or actually it could even be human moderators in any form of data sets. They often work in poor conditions. They do not have access to uh, to lot of money, for instance. And I think the biggest impact is on mental health. And so I, I, I really wanted to just thank you for raising that. I think that's such an important point also. Thank you, Pin. I think Mirka also wanted to respond, and then we have two questions here in the front row. But maybe you go first. Now, just to add that uh, you're absolutely right. This is labor that is typically outsourced, and it's not just because of the economic value, the extractive uh, nature of that, but it's also outsourcing the risk, right? Because this is this is a difficult kind of job, especially if we're talking about content moderation, which involves violent com uh, content, but actually the coding also, it's very uh, laborious. But what's really interesting is that there have been a lot of attempts um, by tech entrepreneurs and tech companies to actually offer such work opportunities to refugees in camps because it was seen as a fantastic opportunity to build up their literacy, digital literacy skills and develop them as potential um, uh, coders or, you know, um, you know, be involved in the industry with extremely low pay. And some of these have not been successful because, you know, they were not deemed, they were not accepted by the UN agencies that were in, responsible for camps, but there have definitely been attempts. And I think in some cases they have actually gone ahead as well. So just to let you know that refugees are often seen as a sort of a ready kind of available population for this kind of difficult work. Interesting. I think the microphone is not switched on. It's a yellow microphone. Hello? Ah, yes. Okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing um, your knowledge with us. That was really interesting. And also thank you, Pin, for the uh, 101 data annotation course that you just um, offered us today, uh, which I found really interesting. Um, I have a question about um, liability and accountability. I think you mentioned that. And I'm really thinking about, because what we've heard today is that there, you know, there are people who will come up with ideas about how to develop these technologies, and there are people or corporations who then develop and produce these kind of technologies. There are people who buy these technologies from these corporations. And so th there's a big chain um, eventually where, where this technology kind of travels through and has different kinds of stops until it is actually applied. So if something goes wrong, um, and let's assume when this Council of Europe um, convention will be in place um, where we look particularly at the human rights aspect of these kind of transactions. Um, who, I mean, how do we hold entities, actors, stakeholders accountable? Maybe we hear uh, Ines' question or first. It goes, it goes a little bit to a different direction, so maybe you ought just answered. Um, yeah, I just, uh, maybe just to, I don't know if I am going to answer your question, but um, it makes me think of, again, this, um, I mean, I think in general, the whole, one of the major issues of this whole kind of um, smartness uh, mandate, talk about smartness, is that the um, accountability um becomes like it it's it's sort of there's this sort of like diffusion of responsibility um and one example that i had to think of immediately was um when i was doing this research about the use of um uh, smartphone data in asylum cases in germany i remember i was interviewing someone who was working um as like a counselor legal counselor for people in the um, asylum um during their asylum cases and um she was saying that she hadn't really seen um you know in decisions she hadn't really seen sort of um ways in which there was a sort of like official reference to um, to the data that was found on the phones, but they had seen a lot that the questioning changed, like the kinds of questions that people were asked in their asylum interviews. But if you don't really have this in the like reference in the decision, you know, there can be this sort of like more indirect way in which that impacted the asylum case. And then it also makes it sort of more difficult 
to, and this goes back, back also to this like black box of a lot of these technologies, it makes it more dif difficult to actually like, appeal a decision, right? If you don't have it sort of um, um, in this like black and white in front of you. Um, so I think um, there's this kind of, I mean, this is just to add to like <laughs> this, this um, yeah, diffused um, accountability, responsibility. Very quickly. No, I think it's these complex supply chains completely diffuse, obliterate, one would say, accountability. And I mean, this is typical of bureaucracies in general, but I think it's amplified with processes of automation. And when you get private companies involved in humanitarian operations, and I'm not talking about just borders here, but humanitarian operations in general, what happens is that they um, should supposedly inherit humanitarian principles and imperatives like do no harm, you know, the principles of humanity, independence and so on. But that actually doesn't happen because they operate on principles like, you know, profit and, you know, uh, expanding their market share and so on, which is not... So you have a fundamental conflict between the providers of aid because humanitarian organizations increasingly now outsource uh, their... Uh, services, but the companies, the vendors, don't necessarily share the same principles. And that creates a huge amount of tensions. And the same way humanitarian organizations, when they start using the infrastructures of, let's say, social media companies, let's say WhatsApp, to do feedback for um, uh, refugee people, they then inherit the problems, the, the sort of the problems associated with companies like Meta, the fact that they have poor data safeguarding records and so on. So, and that is against principles like do no harm. So all I'm trying to say is that this partnership with private companies and NGOs or humanitarian organizations is not without problems. It can obliterate accountability, but it can create fundamental tensions in terms of, you know, what are these organizations for? Um, because there's a fundamental clash. So, unresolved as far as I know. Thank you, Ines, for the very last interventional question. Yeah, maybe it's a, uh, it's, it's more like a comment. And I would like to thank um, Pin Li for your um, recommendation or encouragement of data sovereignty as a work of, for human rights. And um, because I think also this is not so popular so far in the main, or it's not mainstreamed enough. And I, I'm the part of the pr problem here. Um, And um, I think it's very, very, very important to to encourage the state of sovereignty as one big condition for a um, positive intervention. So thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, thank you to, to all of you. Thank you, Pin Lin. Thank you, Misha. Thank you, Mirka. I think this was uh, a lot of food for thought. And I invite everybody to stay here for a little longer, uh, talk to each other. We have our name tags. Um, the experts are going to be in the room. And um, and uh, I hope, I think, open uh, to talk to you and we'll be um, yeah interested to hear your feedback as well. Thank you so much for staying with us. And before, before we all go for a huge round of applause for all the expertise here, I would like to thank you, Monica, for thank this you. amazing facilitation. <laughs> for being with us now in the, the, the second time and I hope main, third time and I think hopefully for, for more times um, in the future. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>